I've had people come to me in conferences that want a word from me. And they say, Pastor, do you have a word for me? Because I used to these seers in Christianity that have words for everybody. So I'm just another fortune teller. Oh, excuse me, I shouldn't have said that. Well, I'm concerned. Do you have a word for me? I said, I do. What is it? Read your Bible. I have found everything pertaining to life in the Bible. I have found everything in the, that tells me how to have a relationship with the Godhead in the Bible. I have found everything in there uh, how to have a relationship with myself in the Bible. I found out the ingredients to have a relationship with everybody else in the Bible. I've even learned how to deal with scorners. I've learned many things. And then I get around these people, if it be God's will. What if it be God's will? Can I give you one verse about it? If it be God's will. When I try and quote it from the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 28, they say, up, 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 up. That's Old Testament. It, it all passed away. Well, I thought we had a better covenant. How come the newer covenant is worse than the first? At least they can get something done back there. I said, no, I won't going to quote you the Old Testament because you want me to quote the new. Yeah. All right. It's, a, it's the Magna Carta scripture of our entire ministry. Be in health. I bet you know where it is, don't you? We know where it is, don't we, John? Third John, verse 2. That's first, second, third John. This is the third little book over there. Third John, verse 2. Dearly beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Is it God's will... Is it God's will that you prosper? Is it God's will that you be in health? Is it God's will that topside you can think straight? It is God's will. Mark it down. Don't get double-minded in this. Find out what the disconnect is that's making that God's will not work in your life. Is there something that's making your faith shipwrecked? I began in ministry years ago in which less than 5% of anybody was healed when I prayed for them. That's a discouraging ministry to only have 5% success. I could have created a 5% a success ministry and called it that. I am the 5% success ministry. What about the other 95%? It's not God's will. Except for I'm baby. And as I struggled with this, because I had read in Psalm 103, verse 3, he is the Old Testament. No, no, yes, back there. He is the Lord, say Lord, who forgives us of all of our iniquities and heals us of all of our diseases. There was a key word that really challenged me, and there was no room for unbelief and doubt in it. Unless I wanted to change God's word. And I had just happened to read the last, the last chapter of Revelation. It said it wasn't cool to change God's word and add and take away. In fact, it was very dangerous to do so. So I didn't want to touch that one. Didn't want to touch that one. So the word that got stuck in my face was the word all. How much is all? What percentage? Is there anything greater than all? You guys do your math well. So he is the Lord that forgives us of 100% all of our iniquities and heals us of 100% of our... Then why aren't we getting it? Should we take that verse out of the Bible? Should we dispensationalize it? Should we say it passed away? Should we? Why don't we just come up with all kinds of reasons why God's not truth? I don't dare tell God he's not truth. Do you want to tell God he's not truth? 
He said about himself, he's not a man that he should lie or son of a man that he should lie. If he said it about himself, I believe him. I like hanging out with people I can take to the bank. You know, you know how awful it is to hang around people that are professional liars? Have you ever met anybody that you really don't trust the thing they say half the time? It's not a good relationship, is it? You'd be like, well, I don't know telling the truth this time or not. Then I began to take a look and to ask God, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Did I just quote that verse? So if you're getting 5% healing and you believe God heals today, which I do, and if you believe the broken body was for the curse, then we sh there should be a sick Christian running around anywhere. I said theoretically. So how come, how come? Did the, did the broken body not work? Now, when he shed his blood for forgiveness of sins, now I could read that over here in, in, in John, that when he, he shed his blood one time for all, even those unborn, forever. So if he shed his blood for forgiveness of sins to cover all humans forever and ever and ever and ever, and, and there are humans on the earth today is every person on the earth today born again? Yes or no? Why aren't they? He shed his blood for all of them. If he shed his blood for all of them, that means he all didn't get born again just because he shed his blood? Or was there a personal requirement to come into covenant with he that shed his blood? What is covenant? Covenant is an agreement between two people. Covenant is an agreement between God and those that bend their knee. It's a covenant. It's an agreement. Now, be, because, because he is the Lord that will heal us of all our diseases, is everybody healed? If he's the Lord that forgives us of all of our iniquities, has everybody been released from their iniquities? Why not? Because they did not enter into agreement with he who sealed the covenant with his blood. So there is a responsibility for created beings to come into agreement, not as a mantra, not as a religious system, not as a system of anything, but into a relationship. Do you know how special it is to be able, by faith, to have a relationship with the Father of all spirits? Pinch yourself, are you for real? Do you really, are you really grateful? Are you really thankful? Do you really appreciate the fact that you have been preserved from extinction by faith? And if it wasn't for that, that your chances for eternity is lake of fire, are you grateful? If you're grateful, then you need to act like it. Why am I hollering for? I think the Christian church is not grateful. It just expects. Sometimes children aren't grateful. They just take it for granted. And the parents become slaves to their lust and their needs. Not all the time. Just most of the time. But we were all kids, weren't we, one time? And we weren't much different, were we? We all yearn for stuff. You know, I learned a long time ago not to give one of my kids a Lamborghini. I don't have the money for one anyway, but I, if I did, I wouldn't give one of my kids. Listen, I had one of my kids flunk these driving tests. You know, you know how he flunked the driving test? Right here in this town. We went to find out if he passed. The guy said, no, he didn't pass. He flunked the test. Why? For speeding. He passed his driving test eventually and wrecked the next two cars, and once he almost died in it. And he was walking from then on because 
no insurance company wanted him and nobody wanted him. So he had buddies and he was walking for a very long time until he figured he needed to grow up. But do we have to learn the hard way? Do we have to learn upside down of a car wreck on a tree limb? Why do we have to learn things when faith could have prevented what we learned the hard way? But it does teach us eventually, does it not? That's that, I count it all joy to be hanging off a tree limb. Count it all joy. I found that there were things in people's lives that were not of God. Have you ever seen anybody in your lifetime and how they thought, spoke, or acted? Thought, spoke, or acted. You're fairly convinced it didn't come from God. Anybody ever bump into one or two of those people? Have you bumped into yourself? It's a hard lesson when you're the object of your learning curve. Front row seat, buddy. I just learned about my iniquity. I thought it was dealt with at the cross. It was, but what did you do with it in your personal life? Thank God for the cross. Now you can deal with it. You mean I can sin as a believer and serve sin and there's still a consequence? Uh Uh-huh. You play around with sexual, inordinate sexual affection as a believing young man or girl and you go out there and fornicate, your born-again experience will not protect you from herpes. So I don't think we should talk about things like this in church. Or do you think we should talk about it? We've been talking about it. We could have prevented it. Are we family or what? Or penguins? Go to church today and hear something significant. What are you talking about, herpes? Which one? Herpes simplex? Life is a journey. You know, one of the things that when we're, I was teaching some of you in For My Life this week, I was over in Isaiah 57 in the high and holy place. And I'll jump back over there because I want to sing tonight. I don't want to talk. I'm just talking. But I think you're getting the picture, aren't you? There are things in our lives that interfere with God's glory, that make our faith shipwreck, that need to be recognized. And over here in Isaiah 57, I think that's where it is, should be. Certainly not in Lamentations. Get me out of there quick. Isaiah 57, here it is. In verse 14, and shall say, Cast ye up, cast ye up, prepare the way, take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. The very next verse is a high and holy place that only he that has a humble and a contrite heart has the right to go. That's where the Father is. The Father of all spirits waiting for you to get it. But there may be things in our lives, many people don't approach that place, the high and holy place, because the sin that they're serving condemns them And they say, when I deal with it, then I'll talk to my father. Now, talk to your father while you're still serving the sin. What do you think happened at the cross anyway? The veil was rent. Come on in. Say, Dad! But see, we're looking at our father in heaven through the eyes of an earthly father. It wasn't always the kindest. And we certainly would not admit our sin to that character, would we? Especially if you're a preacher's kid like me. I was born holy right in front of the womb. You know that's for sure. I was born in dress pants. My wife was a hippie that got saved. What a crew we are. Boy, I was born in dress pants. Take a good look. The stumbling block. I want to take you. We were talking about Isaiah 35, but I just can't get away from this because, and I really wasn't going to talk about anything. I wanted to sing tonight. Here I am talking. Is it okay if I finish this? Isaiah 35 is where we were talking about uh, be bold, be strong. That's in verse 4. And that's said to those that have a fearful heart. And it talks about various people in their journey. 
And in verse 8, it says this. Verse, verse 7 talks of parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, and the habitation of dragons reach lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes before it was barren and a wasteland. Verse 8 is where I'd like to go to. And a highway shall be there, and a way. And it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. But it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, they shall not err therein. No lion shall be there. No any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there. But the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return. Say, I'm a ransomed of the Lord. Do you know that the Father through Jesus came and bought you back from Satan and paid the ransom for your freedom with his blood? Did you really know that? If somebody bailed me out of jail or out of a life sentence, I would be grateful, grateful not to go back to jail again. I'm not very smart, but my mama didn't raise a complete dummy. I'd learn something from my failures. Or do we? Are we habitual in our wanderings and our failures? Some people are addicted to failure. Some people are addicted to sin. Some people are not addicted to God. What is an addiction? We always think of addictions as something bad. There's a good part of addiction. The Bible talks about the good part of addiction. Where your treasure is, there is your heart also. What's an addiction? An addiction is where you put your attention to. It's where you center around. I'm addicted to becoming a son of God by faith. And I'm trying to understand it more every day. And I have not grown up yet. But I have a generation to grow up. And my father is working me over. And I don't want my father to stop convicting me by his spirit. I don't want him to stop instructing me. I don't want my father to leave me alone. Because he will chasten his sons and those that he loves. Because he does not want to share you with the villain. He's jealous for you. He paid a high price to get you back from the villain. Perish the villain. Let God be true and every man a liar. Are you tracking with me? We started this meeting tonight just kind of weaving through some thought. And one of the thoughts that I began to weave with, are you going to have a spine in these last days? Or are you going to be people of fear and begin to bow to your governments and bow to your religions and bow to public opinion that now righteousness is a matter of opinion? Conscience? Seared. Conscience? Well, it's just my truth. What's God's word say? Well, that's archaic. Really? Holiness is a highway that's traveled. These days are going to be days that you need to know God's Word. Just spend some time reading your Bibles. Make it an object of your affection. You know, it's amazing how many people sign up for very expensive five and $600 seminars in America, including Christians, to go to conferences to hear something they think they might need to hear when the Word of God is free to you. And you can read it laying right in your bed. Real hardship. So why are we spending all this time and money when we're not even taking time to hear what our Father has to say to us? And the Lord Jesus is the living Word of the Father. I will tell you that any thought that you have that does not match the Word of God is a form of insanity. 
There's a way that seems right into a man, but the end thereof is destruction. You need to know how your father thinks. Don't say the Bible is a boring subject. You're lazy. People go to and spend forty and fifty and sixty thousand dollars to get an education. You have an eternal one sitting right in front of you called the Bible. It tells the past, helps identify the present, and takes you to the future and lets you know that what no human can tell you about the future, God has told it through his prophets. And if you don't know where you come from and you don't know where you're at and you don't know where you're going, you are lost. You are, it is essential that you understand the word of God in terms of the prophetic journey that you're in, whether you live or whether you die. It may be the only thing that will keep you sane in the days to come as the pressure builds against God's people. The pressure will continue to build against God's people. And not only will Israel become expendable, so won't God's people become expendable to the religious system of the world. Don't be afraid. What's the worst thing that can happen to you? You can die and go to heaven, wait the resurrection, so chill. See, all oh, these conversations like this make me afraid. Count it all joy. Be alert. Be awake. 